Book 2 of Civil Government, Chapter 5 of Property, Section 25. Whether we consider natural reason, which tells us that men, being once born, have a right to their preservation, and consequently to meat and drink, and such other things as nature affords for their subsistence, or revelation, which gives us an account of those grants God made of the world to Adam, and to Noah, and his sons, it is very clear, that God, as King David says, Psalm 115. 16. Has given the earth to the children of men, given it to mankind in common. But this being supposed, it seems to some a very great difficulty, how any one should ever come to have a property in anything, I will not content myself to answer, that if it be difficult to make out property, upon a supposition that God gave the world to Adam, and his posterity in common, it is impossible that any man, but one universal monarch, should have any property upon a supposition, that God gave the world to Adam, and his heirs in succession, exclusive of all the rest of his posterity. But I shall endeavor to show, how men might come to have a property in several parts of that which God gave to mankind in common, and that without any express compact of all the commoners. Section 26 God, who hath given the world to men in common, hath also given them reason to make use of it to the best advantage of life, and convenience. The earth, and all that is therein, is given to men for the support and comfort of their being. And though all the fruits it naturally produces, and beasts it feeds, belong to mankind in common, as they are produced by the spontaneous hand of nature, and nobody has originally a private dominion, exclusive of the rest of mankind, in any of them as they are thus in their natural state, yet being given for the use of men, there must of necessity be a means to appropriate them some way or other, before they can be of any use, or at all beneficial to any particular man. The fruit, or venison, which nourishes the wild Indian, who knows no enclosure, and is still a tenant in common, must be his, and so his, one, e, a part of him, that another can no longer have any right to it before it can do him any good for the support of his life. Section 27 Though the earth, and all inferior creatures, be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person, this nobody has any right to but himself, the labor of his body, and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. Whatsoever then he removes out of the state that nature hath provided, and left it in, he hath mixed his labor with and join to it something that is his own, and thereby makes it his property. It being by him removed from the common state nature hath placed it in, it hath by this labor something annexed to it, that excludes the common right of other men, for this labor being the unquestionable property of the laborer, no man but he can have a right to what that is once joined to, at least where there is enough, and as good, left in common for others. Section. 28. He that is nourished by the acorns he picked up under an oak, or the apples he gathered from the trees in the wood, has certainly appropriated them to himself. Nobody can deny but the nourishment is his. I ask then, when did they begin to be his? When he digested? Or when he eat? Or when he boiled? Or when he brought them home? Or when he picked them up? And it is plain, if the first gathering made them not his, nothing else could. That labor put a distinction between them and common, that added something to them more than nature, the common mother of all, had done, and so they became his private right. And will any one say, he had no right to those acorns or apples, he thus appropriated, because he had not the consent of all mankind to make them his? Was it a robbery thus to assume to himself what belonged to all in common? If such a consent as that was necessary, man had starved, notwithstanding the plenty God had given him. We see in commons, which remain so by compact, that it is the taking any part of what is common, and removing it out of the state nature leaves it in, which begins the property, without which the common is of no use. And the taking of this or that part, does not depend on the express consent of all the commoners. Thus the grass my horse has bit, the turfs my servant has cut, and the ore I have digged in any place where I have a right to them in common with others, become my property, without the assignation or consent of anybody, the labor that was mine, removing them out of that common state they were in, 
hath fixed my property in them. Section 29. By making an explicit consent of every commoner, necessary to any one's appropriating to himself any part of what is given in common, children or servants could not cut the meat, which their father or master had provided for them in common, without assigning to every one his peculiar part. Though the water running in the fountain be every one's, yet who can doubt? but that in the picture is his only who drew it out. His labor hath taken it out of the hands of nature, where it was common, and belonged equally to all her children, and hath thereby appropriated it to himself. Section 30 Thus this law of reason makes the deer that Indians who hath killed it, it is allowed to be his goods, who hath bestowed his labor upon it, though before it was the common right of every one. And amongst those who are counted the civilized part of mankind, who have made and multiplied positive laws to determine property, this original law of nature, for the beginning of property, in what was before common, still takes place, and by virtue thereof, what fish any one catches in the ocean, that great and still remaining common of mankind, or what ambergris any one takes up here, is by the labor that removes it out of that common state nature left it in, made his property, who takes that pains about it, and even amongst us, the hare that any one is hunting, is thought is who pursues her during the chase, for being a beast that is still looked upon as common, and no man's private possession, whoever has employed so much labor about any of that kind, as to find and pursue her, has thereby removed her from the state of nature, wherein she was common, and hath begun a property. Section 31 It will perhaps be objected to this, that if gathering the acorns, or other fruits of the earth, etc. makes a right to them, then any one may engross as much as he will. To which I answer, not Song of Solomon. The same law of nature, that does by this means give us property, does also bound that property too. God has given us all things richly. 1 Timothy 6. 12. Is the voice of reason confirmed by inspiration? But how far has he given it us to enjoy? As much as any one can make use of to any advantage of life before it spoils, so much he may by his labor fix a property in. Whatever is beyond this, is more than his share, and belongs to others. Nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy, and thus, considering the plenty of natural provisions there was a long time in the world, and the few spenders, and to how small a part of that provision the industry of one man could extend, itself, and engross it to the prejudice of others, especially keeping within the bounds, set by reason, of what might serve for his use, there could be then little room for quarrels or contentions about property so established. Section 32 But the chief matter of property being now not the fruits of the earth, and the beasts that subsist on it, but the earth itself as that which takes in and carries with it all the rest, I think it is plain, that property in that too is acquired as the former. As much land as a man tills, plants, improves, cultivates, and can use the product of, so much is his property. He by his labor does, as it were, enclose it from the common. Nor will it invalidate his right, to say everybody else has an equal title to it, and therefore he cannot appropriate, he cannot enclose without the consent of all his fellow commoners, all mankind. God, when he gave the world in common to all mankind, commanded man also to labor, and the penury of his condition required it of him. God and his reason commanded him to subdue the earth, 1. e. Improve it for the benefit of life, and therein lay out something upon it that was his own, his labor, he that in obedience to this command of God, subdued tilled and sowed any part of it, thereby annexed to it something that was his property, which another had no title to, nor could without injury take from him. Section 33 Nor was this appropriation of any parcel of land, by improving it, any prejudice to any other man, since there was still enough, and as good left, and more than yet unprovided could use, so that, in effect, there was nevertheless left for others because of his enclosure for himself for he that leaves as much as another can make use of, does as good as take nothing at all. Nobody could think himself injured by the drinking of another man, though he took a good draught, who had a whole river of the same water left him to quench his thirst, and the case of land and water, where there is enough of both, is perfectly the same. Section 
34. God gave the world to men in common. But since he gave it them for their benefit, and the greatest conveniencies of life they were capable to draw from it, it cannot be supposed he meant it should always remain common and uncultivated. He gave it to the use of the industrious and rational, and labor was to be his title to it, not to the fancy or covetousness of the quarrelsome and contentious. He that had as good left for his improvement, as was already taken up, needed not complain, ought not to meddle with what was already improved by another's labor, if he did, it is plain he desired the benefit of another's pains, which he had no right to, and not the ground which God had given him in common with others to labor on, and whereof there was as good left, as that already possessed, and more than he knew what to do with, or his industry could reach to. Section 35 It is true, in land that is common in England, or any other country, where there is plenty or people under government, who have money and commerce, no one can enclose or appropriate any part, without the consent of all his fellow commoners, because this is left common by compact, 1. e. by the law of the land, which is not to be violated. And though it be common, in respect of some men, it is not so to all mankind, but is the joint property of this country, or this parish. Besides, the remainder, after such enclosure, would not be as good to the rest of the commoners as the whole was when they could all make use of the whole, whereas in the beginning and first peopling of the great common of the world, it was quite otherwise. The law man was under, was rather for appropriating. God commanded, and his wants forced him to labor. That was his property which could not be taken from him wherever he had fixed it, and hence subduing or cultivating the earth, and having dominion, we see are joined together. The one gave title to the other, so that God, by commanding to subdue, gave authority so far to appropriate, and the condition of human life, which requires labor and materials to work on, necessarily introduces private possessions. Section 36 The measure of property nature has well set by the extent of men's labor and the conveniencies of life, no man's labor could subdue, or appropriate all, nor could his enjoyment consume more than a small part, so that it was impossible for any man, this way to entrench upon the right of another, or acquire to himself a property, to the prejudice of his neighbor, who would still have room for as good, and as large a possession, after the other had taken out his, as before it was appropriated. This measure did confine every man's possession to a very moderate proportion, and such as he might appropriate to himself, without injury to anybody, in the first ages of the world, when men were more in danger to be lost by wandering from their company, in the then vast wilderness of the earth, than to be straitened for want of room to plant in. And the same measure may be allowed still without prejudice to anybody, as full as the world seems, for supposing a man, or family, in the state they were at first peopling of the world by the children of Adam, or Noah, let him plant in some inland, vacant places of America, we shall find that the possessions he could make himself, upon the measures we have given would not be very large, nor, even to this day, prejudice the rest of mankind, or give them reason to complain, or think themselves injured by this man's encroachment, though the race of men have now spread themselves to all the corners of the world, and do infinitely exceed the small number was at the beginning. Nay, the extent of ground is of so little value, without labor, that I have heard it affirmed, that in Spain itself a man may be permitted to plow sow and reap, without being disturbed, upon land he has no other title to, but only his making use of it. But, on the contrary, the inhabitants think themselves beholden to him, who, by his industry on neglected, and consequently waste land, has increased the stock of corn, which they wanted. But be this as it will, which I lay no stress on, this I dare boldly affirm, that the same rule of propriety, viz that every man should have as much as he could make use of, would hold still in the world, without straightening anybody, since there is land enough in the world to suffice double the inhabitants, had not the invention of money, and the tacit agreement of men to put a value on it, introduced, by consent, larger possessions, and a right to them, which, how it has done, I shall by and by show more at large. Section 37 This is certain that in the beginning, 
before the desire of having more than man needed had altered the intrinsic value of things, which depends only on their usefulness to the life of man, or had agreed, that a little piece of yellow metal, which would keep without wasting or decay, should be worth a great piece of flesh, or a whole heap of corn, though men had a right to appropriate, by their labor, each one to himself, as much of the things of nature, as he could use, yet this could not be much, nor to the prejudice of others, where the same plenty was still left to those who would use the same industry. To which let me add, that he who appropriates land to himself by his labor, does not lessen, but increase the common stock of mankind, for the provisions serving to the support of human life, produced by one acre of enclosed and cultivated land, are, to speak much within compass, ten times more than those which are yielded by an acre of land of an equal richness lying waste in common. And therefore he that encloses land, and has a greater plenty of the conveniencies of life from ten acres, than he could have from an hundred left to nature, may truly be said to give ninety acres to mankind, for his labor now supplies him with provisions out of ten acres which were but the product of an hundred lying in common. I have here rated the improved land very low, in making its product but as ten to one, when it is much nearer an hundred to one, for I ask, whether in the wild woods and uncultivated waste of America, left to nature, without any improvement, tillage or husbandry, a thousand acres yield the needy and wretched inhabitants as many conveniencies of life, as ten acres of equally fertile land do in Devonshire where they are well cultivated. Before the appropriation of land, he who gathered as much of the wild fruit, killed, caught, or tamed, as many of the beasts, as he could, he that so employed his pains about any of the spontaneous products of nature, as any way to alter them from the state which nature put them in, by placing any of his labor on them, did thereby acquire a propriety in them, but if they perished, in his possession, without their due use, if the fruits rotted, or the venison putrefied, before he could spend it, he offended against the common law of nature, and was liable to be punished, he invaded his neighbor's share, for he had no right, farther than his use called for any of them, and they might serve to afford him conveniencies of life. Section 38 The same measures governed the possession of land to, whatsoever he tilled and reaped, laid up and made use of, before it spoiled that it was his peculiar right, whatsoever he enclosed, and could feed, and make use of, the cattle and product was also his. But if either the grass of his enclosure rotted on the ground, or the fruit of his planting perished without gathering, and laying up, this part of the earth, notwithstanding his enclosure, was still to be looked on as waste, and might be the possession of any other. Thus, at the beginning, Cain might take as much ground as he could till and make it his own land, and yet leave enough to Abel's sheep to feed on, a few acres would serve for both their possessions, but as families increased, and industry enlarged their stocks, their possessions enlarged with the need of them, but yet it was commonly without any fixed property and the ground they made use of, till they incorporated, settled themselves together, and built cities, and then, by consent, they came in time to set out the bounds of their distinct territories, and agree on limits between them and their neighbors, and by laws within themselves, settled the properties of those of the same society, for we see, that in that part of the world which was, first inhabited, and therefore like to be best peopled, even as low down as Abraham's time, they wandered with their flocks, and their herds, which was their substance, freely up and down, and this Abraham did in a country where he was a stranger, whence it is plain, that at least a great part of the land lay in common, that the inhabitants valued it not, nor claimed property in any more than they made use of, but when there was not room enough in the same place, for their herds to feed together, they by consent, as Abraham and Lot did, Genesis 13, 5, separated and enlarged their pasture, where it best liked them, and for the same reason Esau went from his father, and his brother, and planted in Mount Seir, Genesis 36. 6. Section. 39. And thus, without supposing any private dominion, and property in Adam, over all the world, exclusive of all other men, which can no way be proved, nor any one's property be made out from it, 
but supposing the world given, as it was, to the children of men in common, we see how labor could make men distinct titles to several parcels of it, for their private uses, wherein there could be no doubt of right, no room for quarrel. Section 40. Nor is it so strange, as perhaps before consideration it may appear, that the property of labor should be able to overbalance the community of land, for it is labor indeed that puts the difference of value on everything, and let any one consider what the difference is between an acre of land planted with tobacco or sugar, sown with wheat or barley, and an acre of the same land lying in common, without any husbandry upon it, and he will find, that the improvement of labor makes the far greater part of the value. I think it will be but a very modest computation to say, that of the products of the earth useful to the life of man nine-tenths are the effects of labor, nay, if we will rightly estimate things as they come to our use, and cast out the several expenses about them, what in them is purely owing to nature, and what to labor, we shall find, that in most of them ninety-nine hundredths are wholly to be put on the account of labor. Section 41 There cannot be a clearer demonstration of anything than several nations of the Americans are of this, who are rich in land, and poor in all the comforts of life. Whom nature having furnished as liberally as any other people, with the materials of plenty, one. e. A fruitful soil, apt to produce in abundance, what might serve for food, raiment, and delight, yet for want of improving it by labor, have not one hundredth part of the conveniencies we enjoy, and a king of a large and fruitful territory there feeds, lodges, and is clad worse than a day laborer in England. Section 42. To make this a little clearer, let us but trace some of the ordinary provisions of life, through their several progresses, before they come to our use, and see how much they receive of their value from human industry. Bread, wine and cloth, are things of daily use, and great plenty, yet notwithstanding, acorns, water and leaves, or skins, must be our bread, drink and clothing, did not labor furnish us with these more useful commodities, for whatever bread is more worth than acorns, wine than water, and cloth or silk, than leaves, skins or moss, that is wholly owing to labor and industry, the one of these being the food and raiment which unassisted nature furnishes us with, the other, provisions which our industry and pains prepare for us, which how much they exceed the other in value when any one hath computed, he will then see how much labor makes the far greatest part of the value of things we enjoy in this world, and the ground which produces the materials, is scarce to be reckoned in, as any, or at most, but a very small part of it, so little, that even amongst us, land that is left wholly to nature, that hath no improvement of pasturage, tillage, or planting, is called, as indeed it is, waste and we shall find the benefit of it amount to little more than nothing. This shows how much numbers of men are to be preferred to largeness of dominions, and that the increase of lands, and the right employing of them, is the great art of government, and that prince, who shall be so wise and godlike, as by established laws of liberty to secure protection and encouragement to the honest industry of mankind, against the oppression of power and narrowness of party, will quickly be too hard for his neighbors but this by the by, to return to the argument in hand, section 43, an acre of land, that bears here twenty bushels of wheat, and another in America, which, with the same husbandry, would do the like, ah, without doubt, of the same natural intrinsic value, but yet the benefit mankind receives from there, one in a year, is worth five fifty, and from the other possibly not worth a penny, if all the profit an Indian received from it were to be valued, and sold here, at least, I may truly say, not one thousand, it is labor then which puts the greatest part of value upon land, without which it would scarcely be worth anything, it is to that we owe the greatest part of all its useful products, for all that the straw, bran, bread, of that acre of wheat, is more worth than the product of an acre of as good land, which lies waste is all the effect of labor, for it is not barely the plowman's pains, the reapers and threshers toil, and the baker's sweat, is to be counted into the bread we eat, the labor of those who broke the oxen, who digged and wrought the iron and stones, 
who felled and framed the timber employed about the plow, mill, oven, or any other utensils, which are a vast number, requisite to this corn, from its being seed to be sown to its being made bread, must all be charged on the account of labor, and received as an effect of that, nature and the earth furnished only the almost worthless materials, as in themselves, it would be a strange catalogue of things, that industry provided and made use of, about every loaf of bread, before it came to our use, if we could trace them, iron, wood, leather, bark, timber, stone, bricks, coals, lime, cloth, dyeing drugs, pitch, tar, masts, ropes, and all the materials made use of in the ship, that brought any of the commodities made use of by any of the workmen, to any part of the work, all which it would be almost impossible, at least too long, to reckon up. Section. 44. From all which it is evident, that though the things of nature are given in common, yet man, by being master of himself, and proprietor of his own person, and the actions or labor of it, had still in himself the great foundation of property, and that, which made up the great part of what he applied to the support or comfort of his being, when invention and arts had improved the conveniencies of life, was perfectly his own, and did not belong in common to others. Section. 45. Thus labor, in the beginning, gave a right of property, wherever any one was pleased to employ it upon what was common, which remained a long while the far greater part, and is yet more than mankind makes use of men, at first, for the most part, contented themselves with what unassisted nature offered to their necessities, and though afterwards, in some parts of the world, where their increase of people and stock, with the use of money, had made land scarce, and so of some value, the several communities settled the bounds of their distinct territories, and by laws within themselves regulated the properties of the private men of their society, and so, by compact and agreement, settled the property which labor and industry began, and the leagues that have been made between several states and kingdoms, either expressly or tacitly disowning all claim and right to the land in the other's possession, have, by common consent, given up their pretenses to their natural common right, which originally they had to those countries, and so have, by positive agreement, settled a property amongst themselves, in distinct parts and parcels of the earth, yet there are still great tracts of ground to be found, which, the inhabitants thereof not having joined with the rest of mankind, in the consent of the use of their common money, lie waste, and are more than the people who dwell on it do, or can make use of, and so still lie in common, though this can scarce happen amongst that part of mankind that have consented to the use of money. Section 46 The greatest part of things really useful to the life of man, and such as the necessity of subsisting made the first commoners of the world look after, as it doth the Americans now, are generally things of short duration, such as, if they are not consumed by use, will decay and perish of themselves, gold, silver and diamonds, are things that fancy or agreement hath put the value on, more than real use, and the necessary support of life. Now are those good things which nature hath provided in common, every one had a right, as hath been said, to as much as he could use, and property in all that he could effect with his labor, all that his industry could extend to, to alter from the state nature had put it in, was his. He that gathered a hundred bushels of acorns or apples, had thereby a property in them, they were his goods as soon as gathered. He was only to look, that he used them before they spoiled, else he took more than his share, and robbed others. And indeed it was a foolish thing, as well as dishonest, to hoard up more than he could make use of. If he gave away a part to anybody else, so that it perished not uselessly in his possession, these he also made use of, and if he also bartered to wait plums, that would have rotted in a week, for nuts that would last good for his eating a whole year, he did no injury, he wasted not the common stock, destroyed no part of the portion of goods that belonged to others, so long as nothing perished uselessly in his hands. Again, if he would give his nuts for a piece of metal, pleased with its color, or exchange his sheep for shells, or wool for a sparkling pebble or a diamond, and keep those by him all. His life, he invaded not the right of others, he might heap up as much of these durable things as he pleased, 
the exceeding of the bounds of his just property not lying in the largeness of his possession, but the perishing of anything uselessly in it. Section 47 And thus came in the use of money, some lasting thing that men might keep without spoiling, and that by mutual consent men would take in exchange for the truly useful, but perishable supports of life. Section 48 And as different degrees of industry were apt to give men possessions in different proportions, so this invention of money gave them the opportunity to continue and enlarge them, for supposing an island, separate from all possible commerce with the rest of the world, wherein there were but an hundred families, but there were sheep, horses and cows, with other useful animals, wholesome fruits, and land enough for corn for a hundred thousand times as many, but nothing in the island, either because of its commonness, or perishableness, fit to supply the place of money, what reason could any one have there to enlarge his possessions beyond the use of his family, and a plentiful supply to its consumption, either in what their own industry produced, or they could barter for like perishable, useful commodities, with others, where there is not something, both lasting and scarce, and so valuable to be hoarded up, their men will be apt to enlarge their possessions of land, were it never so rich, never so free for them to take, for I ask, what would a man value ten thousand, or an hundred thousand acres of excellent land, ready cultivated, and well stocked too with cattle, in the middle of the inland parts of America, where he had no hopes of commerce with other parts of the world, to draw money to him by the sale of the product, it would not be worth the enclosing, and we should see him give up again to the wild common of nature, whatever was more than would supply the conveniencies of life to be had there for him and his family. Section 49 Thus in the beginning all the world was America, and more so than that is now, for no such thing as money was anywhere known. Find out something that hath the use and value of money amongst his neighbors, you shall see the same man will begin presently to enlarge his possessions. Section 50 but since gold and silver, being little useful to the life of man in proportion to food, raiment, and carriage, has its value only from the consent of men, whereof labor yet makes, in great part, the measure, it is plain, that men have agreed to a disproportionate and unequal possession of the earth, they having, by a tacit and voluntary consent, found out a way how a man may fairly possess more land than he himself can use the product of by receiving in exchange for the overplus gold and silver, which may be hoarded up without injury to any one, these metals not spoiling or decaying in the hands of the possessor. This partage of things in an inequality of private possessions, men have made practicable out of the bounds of society, and without compact, only by putting a value on gold and silver, and tacitly agreeing in the use of money, for in governments, the laws regulate the right of property and the possession of land is determined by positive constitutions. Section 51 And thus, I think, it is very easy to conceive, without any difficulty, how labor could at first begin a title of property in the common things of nature, and how the spending it upon our uses bounded it, so that there could then be no reason of quarreling about title, nor any doubt about the largeness of possession it gave. Right and conveniency went together for as a man had a right to all he could employ his labor upon, so he had no temptation to labor for more than he could make use of. This left no room for controversy about the title, nor for encroachment on the right of others. What portion a man carved to himself, was easily seen, and it was useless, as well as dishonest, to carve himself too much, or take more than he needed, 